So, we are studying the book of Colossians, and our text today is perhaps not just the most important of the book of Colossians, but it is one of the most important texts of the entire Bible. As we come together, I I want you to remember each week what it is that is the main message of the book of Colossians. Is Christ enough? Or do you need more than Jesus to be right with God? Let me illustrate that with a story of a real estate agent that was driving through the country. And she saw a quaint little farmhouse and she saw a hand lettered sign for sale out front. So she just without invitation drove her car up the driveway and knocked on the door. When they opened the door, she came into the home and and she said, oh, I think we could do a lot with this place. A little paint over there and some new light fixtures over here. A a little bit of wallpaper back there. We could really make this place appealing to any buyer. Well, the man said, well, ma'am, thanks for all those tips. But the sign does not say house for sale. It says horse for sale. And I bet you know people like that who constantly want to fix you. Constantly want to improve you. What is happening in Colossae is that some false teachers have come along and they they have said, Jesus is a very good first step, but but we can make you better. We can make you more spiritual if you'll just listen to us. And what Paul is saying in Colossians is that you have been given fullness in Christ. Is Christ enough or do you need more. Now, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to tell you before we even read our text this morning what the point is. The, the crucial point of this entire sermon is this. Write this down in your sermon sheets. We will trust Christ's sufficiency when we grasp his supremacy. We will trust his sufficiency. He will become our all in all as we truly grasp his sufficiency. The false teachers in Colossae were not denying Christ. They were were doing what all of the cults do today. They were dethroning Christ. They were saying, there's no way that God could have created the world because God is, is holy. This world is evil. So there's this series of spirit beings between man and God. And the gap between man and God, you have to be able to navigate through all of those different spirit beings to be able to get to God. Now, Christ is one of those beings. And you need to know Christ. But they would say, that's not all you need to know. To be able to get to God, you need to know more. And you need to understand that is straight from the pit of hell. Satan does not get people to deny Jesus. What he gets people to do is diminish Jesus. That way, Jesus is not the one and only between man and God. He is one of many. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What Satan is busy doing is keeping people from seeing who Jesus really is. That's why people add to the gospel. That's why we have cults. That's why we have legalism. That's why we have this problem in Colossae. See, people want to fix. They want to improve the gospel because they just don't know how much Jesus is. My prayer is to help you with that this morning. Before Paul gets to chapter 2 and... The problems of the teachings of the false teachers, he said in chapter 1, we needed to be reminded of the resume of Jesus. We need to be reminded of, of just who Jesus is. 1893, there was the World Expo in Chicago. 21 million visitors came to see it. 
One of the displays was called the World Parliament of Religions. And, and leaders from, from all the great religious faiths met in the building and talked about their faith and dialogued about how their faiths have so much in common. Well, Dwight L. Moody, he saw this as a great opportunity for evangelism. So he set up a theater and a tent right out by the fair. And he preached every night to people that were coming in to the World Fair. And he was criticized. And his critics said, you don't attack the World Parliament of Religions. You, you don't attack all of those other faiths. And he said, that's not my plan. My plan is to make Christ so attractive that people will turn to him without me having to do the other. That's what Paul is doing. He is going to make Christ so attractive that you will realize it is ludicrous to think that you need more than Jesus to be right with God. By the way, most scholars think that the verses that we're going to read, verses 15 through 20 in Colossians 1, was, a, was an early Christian hymn. If, if you study the, the lyricism and the vernacular of the original text, you realize it looks a lot like a song. What Paul was evidently doing was saying, I want to remind you uh, using one of our favorite songs of just who Jesus is before I talk about all these, these guys and their teachings. And we need songs like that because Paul is going to say in Colossians 3, the latter part of verse 16, admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart. We need songs that lift up Christ, that exalt Christ, that remind us of the supremacy of Christ. And there is no song that could do that better than the song that we are going to look at today. Chapter 1, verse 15 of Colossians. Read it in your own Bible. This is what Paul wrote. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now that is the original song titled Above All Else. And remember, who was that song written about? It was written about a man who a few years earlier had died on a Roman cross. And now Christians are going all over the world. They're singing a song about a man who was killed on a cross. That's pretty amazing. And I want you to consider these two incredible claims that Paul is making about Christ and who he is. The first is this. He is all Lord. He is the image of the invisible God. Philosophers back then would parcel out deity among all of these little mini spirit beings. To them, Christ was just one of the many beings between man and God. And, and that kind of thinking still exists today. It was very prevalent. That's why we have cults. The basic philosophy of, of our day and age is that there are many ways for you to get to God. There are many paths. Christ is just one of those paths. And Colossians is asking the question, is Christ one of the options to God or is he the only way to God? Is there something unique about Christ? I want you to remember something. Jesus was not killed for what he did. Jesus was killed for what he said. People will say today, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Are you kidding me? Read your Bibles. John chapter 10, verses 30 through 33. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. 
Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now that was the audacious claim of Christ. And they killed him for it. And Paul affirms it. Paul said that God wanted to stuff himself into time and space and history. And when he did, the result was a man named Jesus. All through the Bible, God condemns idolatry. Do you know why? Because you cannot make an image of God without devaluing or defacing God. You cannot produce an image of God that's worthy of him and that represents his magnificence and his glory. What if God decided to? What if God decided to produce an image of himself? The Bible says he did. Look at John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus was not just a a sketch of God. He was a portrait of God all filled in. Look at verse 15 again from the Living Bible. Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. So Paul would vehemently reject this notion that every founder of every religion in the world has a little bit of God in him. For those of us that have been studying Islam on Wednesday nights, we could affirm by not trying to disparage any Muslim in any way, but definitely say God was very much not in Muhammad. Paul would say that Jesus is all God and no other man has any. He is all Lord. And if that's true, then the second claim is true as well. And that is he is Lord of all. He's not just the exact image of the invisible God, but he he says he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses will come up to your door, and, and if you listen to them, you listen closely, they're going to say a lot of wonderful things about Jesus. And they're going to say, though, that he was created. They'll say, it says right here in Colossians 1, verse 15, Jesus is the firstborn. So they say that obviously means that he was created. They don't know their Bibles because firstborn in the Bible does not always mean firstborn in time. Sometimes it means in position. Like, for example, look what the psalmist wrote concerning David. Psalm 89, verse 27. I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Now, firstborn here does not mean first son. David was not the first son. He wasn't even the first king. Firstborn is a biblical metaphor for sovereignty for supremacy and when Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn of creation what he is saying is that Jesus has absolute preeminence it's ludicrous to think that you need to add anything to Jesus that he needs to be supplemented he is Lord of all therefore he is sufficient to be my all in all So let's get more specific because in the following verses, verses 16 through 20 in Colossians 1, Paul explains exactly what he means. Well, what is he saying? First is this. All things are made by him. Everything that exists, whether it is visible or invisible, it was made by Jesus. It was made for Jesus. There is not one single square inch of the universe that does not belong to Christ. By the way, that's why we do not worship nature. I do not believe in mother nature. Nature is not my mother. Nature is my little sister. Nature and I were both made by the Father, and the Father loves me more. I don't worship the created. I worship the creator. John chapter 1 verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. No wonder when you read through the gospels. You you ever notice how creation instantly obeyed the commands of Jesus? Do you know why? The creation, unlike us, recognizes its master. So Jesus said, you know, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And fish just filled up those nets. He could take fish and loaves and pass them out and they would reproduce. 
He could curse a tree and it would die on the spot. He could, he could be in a boat in the middle of a storm and he could say, be quiet. And it would instantly be calm. He could walk up to a cripple and say, stand up and walk. And he would. He could walk up to someone who was blind and say, start seeing. And he would. He could say to a person in a tomb, come out. And they would come out. Because creation recognizes its master and does exactly what its master says. But he didn't just make everything. You see, he holds all things together as well. There is a principle of cohesion in this universe. Why is it a cosmos with order instead of chaos? It's because Jesus is holding it together. The Hebrew author says in the first chapter... The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He holds it together. And when he comes back and when he says, burn up, it is going to burn up. It will do exactly what he tells it to do. If you go to New York City, right across the street from each other, there are two statues. Both reflect humanism and biblical faith. In front of the RCA building, there is a statue of Atlas with the world on his back. And he is bending over under the burden of of trying to hold up the world. To go right across the street to St. Patrick's Cathedral, you will see a picture of an eight or nine year old Jesus as a little boy holding the whole world in his hand. The Bible says he's holding the whole world in his hands. Look again at verse 16 from the message. It says, for everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible, invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. And by the way, did you know that you are a walking testimony to the creative power of Jesus because you are a new creation by his word? You were made a new person. You are an evidence that Jesus made all things. Not only does Paul say that he made all things, not only does he hold all things together, but also all things are subject to him. We can trust his absolute adequacy because of this absolute authority he holds. Paul says thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, they all answer to Christ. Let me give you an example. Angels are subject to Christ. In Colossians, there was a real worry about angels. How are we going to get to God to to get through all of those angels to get to him? Well, you don't have to worry about that. Jesus made the angels and angels answer to Jesus. Look what we looked at Hebrews 1 earlier in verse 3. The latter part of the verse continues. After he had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Angels are subject to Christ. You know what else? Demons are subject to Christ. Why do you find in all of the New Testament, there is never an example of a demon arguing with Jesus. You find not one single time where Jesus told the demon to leave and the demon didn't do it. When Jesus showed up, demons shuddered because they knew they were about to be told what to do and they could not stop it. Demons are subject to Jesus. By the way, the church is subject to Jesus. Paul said he is the head of the church. Now, I know throughout history there have been men and women who think that they actually own the church. But listen, nobody owns the church. And if you act like you own the church one day, you're going to stand before the real owner and you're going to give an account of yourself. Jesus owns the church and angels and demons and the church. They are all subject to him. By the way, death is even subject to Jesus. Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He was not the first to come back from the dead. 
But he was the first to come back in true resurrection life. He was the first to come back with a glorified body that will never die again. And what Paul says is that because he has come back, And because death has to answer to Jesus, the future resurrection of every single person that trusts Jesus has been guaranteed. He writes in 1 Corinthians 15, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And when he comes back, folks, he's going to speak a word. And all of the graves are going to open up because death answers to Jesus. When Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, come out. You know why he said Lazarus's name? Because if he just said, come out, every grave on planet Earth would have opened up. So he had to be specific. But when he comes again, he's just going to say, Come out and death will release its hold over every grave and it will open. Paul says in Colossians 1, the latter part of verse 18, from beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything, everyone. Let me show you a verse that will give you a tingle up your leg. Ephesians 1, 22 Paul writes, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Those last three words, for the church. It is for our sake. We don't have to worry about angels or demons or death. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. God has put everything under the feet of Jesus for you and me. All things are made by him. All things are held together by him. All things are subject to him. And finally, Paul says this, all things are reconciled through him. Look what he says again in verses 19 and 20. For God was pleased To have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Everything sin has marred, everything sin has fractured, has been made right because of what God did through Christ on the cross. Look at verse 20 one more time from the Living Bible. It was through what his son did that God cleared a path for everything to come to him. All things in heaven and on earth. For Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. Folks, there is nothing more to add. There is nothing more that God can do. God has done all that God can do to bridge that space between God and man. All things are reconciled through Christ. Now be careful. Universal reconciliation does not mean universal salvation. I'm not saying that all will be saved. I'm saying that all can be saved. And I'm saying that all who are saved are going to have this in common. They have made peace with God through the blood of Jesus. And there is something else I'm about to preach on that is honestly too big for me to understand. So for the next 60 seconds, just know that I'm telling you something I don't fully grasp. Paul says that this reconciliation does not just encompass all men. He says it encompasses all things. Christ is not just the hope of men. He is the hope of all creation. In the 8th chapter of Romans, it says that the creation is, is groaning. It's waiting for its day of redemption. God, through Christ, is going to bring everything marred by sin into harmony with his divine intent. It wasn't just mankind that sin ruined. Sin messed up God's intent for the entire creation. 
And God is fixing it through Christ and he is going to make it evident to everybody someday. What I'm saying is that something happened at the cross of cosmic significance that is more than we can ever even imagine. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. It says, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. He made all things. He holds all things together. He is above all things. He reconciles all things. Paul's point is clear, folks. What more can God do? What more can he give that he has not done and given in Christ? You remember when promise keepers had their rallies in football stadiums all across America and they were at their height? They were about to have a, a rally at... Mile High Stadium in Denver, 70,000 men bought tickets. One of the speakers was going to be the great black preacher from Los Angeles, E.B. Hill. One of the newspapers was interviewing Mr. Hill, and they said, so what are 70,000 men in Mile High Stadium going to do for two days? E.B. Hill said, we're going to talk about Jesus. And the reporter said, is that all? A little later, E.V. Hill said when he got up to speak, that reporter don't know how much Jesus is. And that is our problem. We forget how much Jesus is. We get distracted. We try to fill up our lives with a bunch of junk because we think we need more. And we have forgotten how much we have in Christ. He is above all else. He is all Lord. He is Lord of all. And one day, and this is my final point, one day all will acknowledge his lordship. One day all of the universe will see what we see. Why don't they see it now? Well, before I I read a scripture to you, I want to tell you a story. One of the most famous statues ever made was was made of Christ by the Danish sculptor Bertolt Thorvaldsen. He worked in a studio for many hours and he formed the the image of, of the soft clay of Christ with his hands extended and his face up to heaven. But he left the studio that night and there was a mist from the sea that that came in and it affected the clay somehow. And to his horror, when he came back the next morning, the clay had changed a little bit of its shape and the head of Christ had tilted over. He thought it was ruined. The more he looked at it, he thought, no, it's perfect. And he left the sculpture that way. This is that sculpture Some people wondered, why did he do it that way? I mean, the face of Christ is more difficult to see because it's it's looking down. And that Danish artist would simply say this. You can't see the face of Christ unless you bow. You've got to be on your knees to see Jesus. One day, everybody's going to bow. Paul writes in Philippians 2, God exalted him. To the highest place. And he gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Every being created in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. They're all going to bow. You and I are are going to bow. But I think that on that day, there's going to be two different types of, of bowing postures. I think some are going to bow. And they're going to be with their arms up on their knees looking and saying, Jesus is Lord with a smile on their face. Jesus is Lord. Others are going to be bowed in a almost fetal like position with their hands and feet and face down. And they're going to be murmuring and mumbling, Jesus is Lord. 
we're all going to bow. We just get to choose how. And Paul says, you don't see Jesus unless he is above everything else in your view. I want to tell you, as I close this out, this is how I want to close out my sermon, by, by reading to you something that was written by a pastor that I respect in an immense way. His name is Ken Graves. He preaches in a church in Bangor, Maine. This is entitled Still More. He wrote this. We really thought we knew him. We answered his call and we followed. A mismatched band of men. We were sailing off into tomorrow. I never knew a man to work so hard and spend himself like him. And at last I saw him finally lay down while his old light was growing dim. And darkness came, as did the wind. That lake became a beast that howled and roared and reached for us. Thirteen mortals for its feast. And I believed now seemed a lie and nothing made any sense. Waves of terror washed over my soul, each one even more intense. I felt my way to the back of the boat to where I'd seen him lay. So human was he that in his fatigue, despite those pounding waves, he slept. Like a man unaware that there was any reason for fear. Like one who knew just where he was going and that what he was doing here. Then one angry thought broke through my fear as my panic reached its peak. It erupted out of the hostile question. I could not help but speak. We're going to die, I cried out loud to the one who would lead us there. You said, let's go over, but we're going under. How is it that you don't care? At first he said nothing, but seemed to be struggling with a mind not fully awakened. Straight from his dream into our nightmare, Yet he wasn't the least bit shaken. Oh, he stood up suddenly and steadied himself. With one hand he held to the ropes, like holding the reins of a station he rode, or stallion he rode through that rising and falling of the boat. One hand on the ropes, one hand in the air as we cowered along the sides. He confronted that beast that caused us to cower so frightened and terrified. The words that he spoke were not a request. They were not a victim's plea. His words were not louder than the howl of the wind or the roar of the Galilee. But his words carried power, undeniable power. Even the force of the wind had to flee. Mightier than the thunder of the great waves, mightier than breakers of the sea, he spoke to that wind like it was a dog. He commanded, muzzled its jaw, and it fled with its tail between its legs. We huddled in silence and awe. Everything was quiet upon hearing those words, the water, the earth, and the sky. Nothing more silent and speechless than we, who just witnessed with our eyes. This man who took lordship over nature, for whom nature immediately complied, now turned his gaze upon us men just beginning to slowly arise. Why were you afraid, he asked us. How is it that you have no faith? We had no answer to give him then. We had no answer. We looked back. We could only say that we were afraid of what was against us because we did not realize what manner of man he was that we followed and trusted with our very lives. We had no answer for his question to us, but we had many questions of our own. Someone finally spoke those words that still echo in my soul. What manner of man indeed is he still more than I can know.